Well, Dave, I took my car into the shop and I, I found out some rather surprising news. I uh, I need a new horn. A new uh, new from the one that squeaked last year? <laughs> I, I burned through the second horn. No, I'm God, on my, Brad! <laughs> I'm on my third well, horn. Brad, I'm, I'm speaking not as your friend, but as your therapist. You need to work on the road rage, my friend. <laughs> it's really not it's really not road rage so much as it's I. I <laughs> It, so often people are so busy on their phones they're not driving sure. and the light turns and I'm not giving them an angry beep but I am giving them a little polite <laughs> beep beep so I that I just by contrast Brad I fire my horn I'm not kidding twice a year oh. three times a year tops we we must drive in completely different t- uh, traffic because I'm telling you, it's a daily thing. I, I blow it at least once a, a, a day where I have got get behind somebody and I can see through the window. They've got their head down. They're fascinated by whatever the fuck is on their phone. And the light's been green for minutes now. And it's like, all right, now, peep, peep. Time for you to move. Time for you to move on. It's always very polite. I always wave with a little smile. Peep, peep. And <laughs> and on we go. So at least at least once a driving session in and once a driving session home, you're firing up your horn. I, no, I wouldn't say it. I, I, I'd say at least once a day, at least once uh, uh, either there or back. I end up having to give somebody a polite little honk. Now, with the caveat that uh, human existence is hard, we all walk a tricky road. I yeah. want to ask you, if you are angry twice a day, is that the world's fault or should one look <laughs> inward? <laughs> again, again, I am in complete control of my emotions. As you hear on this show, week in, week out, I am a master of Zen calmness. <laughs> okay, so the counter argument to that is that two people in your life, your mechanic and your physician, are t- telling you that both have high blood pressure and a horn that has been worn out from overuse. And could there be a connection here? I'm just saying as a friend. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's not me. It's these people won't put their phones down. We've got, we've got driving to do out here. There's people with a life. What's amazing about that response is, I'm telling you, it's not me. It's these goddamn people with their goddamn cars driving down the goddamn street. I'm like, Brad, Brad, get off the ledge. (laughs) Oh, and on that note, I want to say hello, everybody, and welcome to a very zen and calm comic lab, the show about making comics. And peacefully making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, the author of the Web Comics Handbook and the creator of the Gosh Darn Evil Link. And I'm his pal Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon, and owner of a nigh pristine car horn <laughs> on my 2012 <laughs> Honda Odyssey. <laughs> And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. And a reminder to everyone that you could be watching us stream live each week as we record the show for our Comic Lab Live Gab friends. And there's a concurrent chat running alongside the stream where we answer your questions before, during, and after the show. And if you happen to miss the live stream for Life, Love, or Learning, it is archived each week so you can watch the stream later at your convenience. So do join us over at Patreon. And Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And uh, listen, no more talk of of roads or cars or those (laughs) terrible people, Brad. Today, we're going to focus on comics and the joy of making comics and how we can better do that on Comic Lab. (laughs) Okay. So, Brad, a lot to talk about today. A lot of lot of big topics. What is our first topic this week, my friend? Well, this one comes in from our Patreon backer, Garth, who says, hey, Brad and Dave, the churn is real and to be expected just as part of the way Patreon works. But guys, do you have any tips on coping with seeing that number drop 10 to 20 percent, maybe sometimes more at the beginning of the month, even knowing that it'll climb back up? Do Do you just not look at it? 
Is that monthly kickoff, yikes, feeling something you need to stay hungry? How do you balance your hunger with your mental well-being? <laughs> if you yeah. know, I'd love to hear it. Thanks in advance from Garth. Uh, Davey's talking about what I often call the Patreon dip. It's that churn at yes. the end of the month. A lot of people uh, either they, they jump out before they're going to get uh, charged again for the next month, or they jump out when they realize they just got uh, uh, charged uh, and 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 your Patreon numbers don't uh, take a take a big uh, dip. Uh, Garth is saying that sometimes it's ten to twenty percent. How do you survive that beginning of the month yips? Well, uh, Garth, I got to tell you, in terms of being mental well being, I want to tell you that the entire time that Brad was reading that question, he had a car steering wheel on his desk and was just laying on the horn <laughs> the whole right. time. Uh, he's, he's, it's, it's almost a Pavlovian response now with Brad. He just immediately goes for the horn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as he's reading this question. No, this is a super valid question. And Garth, you're not alone that I uh, I have uh, since switched to Patreon's new billing model where if someone joins on the 15th, their next cancellation or their potential drop-off point would be the 15th. And for a different yeah. person, they would join on the 17th, their drop-off point would be on the 17th. Um, and I have, I my long-term thought with that is that I would like to actually remove this dip so that at any given point in the month, I'm losing one or two people, and at any given point in the month, I'm gaining two or three people. That's the hope. Yeah. Uh, because I, I never liked this dip, and I never quite honestly liked the billing model where everyone was charged on the first, no matter what day of the month you joined on because if you joined on the first it was great and brad had a whole workaround about how to like hey i'll pay i'll email you when it's the first again um but if someone joined on the 25th they would basically get shortchanged in that prorated month it, because it wasn't prorated it was it was you paid the full the full whatever it was for yeah the month even if you were joining on the 25th anyway so i have now gone to the new system and i think it's going to take time it's going to take a couple years for this patreon dip for me to uh to sort of even itself out but i would advise if anyone is starting a patreon or hasn't yet started a patreon by all means go to this new method of building where uh people are billed the day they join which honestly makes more sense it's what readers come to expect it's what users have mm -hmm. come to expect with magazines with anything else that it's it's your drop-off point is the day you joined um before we do jump into the dip brad how, what are your current thoughts on that billing model versus the first of the month billing model oh i'm i'm uh, i'm trying to think i don't think i've made that jump yet but but listen don't go by me because it took me a long time to uh and i mean like just within the last year or so to finally uh jump into charge up front right which i right. really dragged my feet on so i don't think i've done that quite yet uh uh, and 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 again, I'll probably I'll probably come around eventually. <laughs> uh, but I, I can tell you this, Garth, and, and that is number one: you're not alone. In fact, I just I I I know this isn't completely accurate number, but I I just looked up Garth on uh, uh, on Graftrion just to see what kind of dip we're looking at. And it looks pretty familiar. I can I can see the same dip going on on uh, on what I'm doing over here. It's it's very very familiar numbers. Uh, so number one, you're not alone. You're not weird. Uh, let's talk about some ways uh, that we can that we can even out the bumps a little bit. Okay. First okay. of all, I will tell you just from me. Uh, like I never even, I can't even bring myself to look at my payout until like the third of the month. Like I can't look at it on the first day and see that they're only 37% through all of the charges you're, and everything. You're kidding. Really? You it can't gives even. Me, oh, it gives me such anxiety because oh. I'm, I'm, I can't, I can't even look, I can't even look. I, I wait until the third and then I look at, cause I know at that point they will have charged a hundred percent and I'll see what my number is and I'll live and die by that number. And usually it's, it's for the last few months, it's been pretty, pretty steady. It's been, it's been a little, a couple hundred low here, a couple hundred high there. It's been fairly steady. But it it just it I I, I just I, I'm telling you, Garth, you're not alone. No. <laughs> it it gives me very much anxiety uh during the first of the month. So let's talk about some ways that you can uh as, here here's here's one way that I've used to try to even out that bump a little bit. And that's this. 
I really like the idea of a special offer. And we've talked about how to do a special offer on the show before. It's basically where you say, hey, everybody that's a Patreon backer by the last day of the month gets this special reward. And it's a digital reward that you send out. Okay. Uh, and I love doing it. I, I, and, and as a matter of fact, I've done it so much that I don't even really use Patreon's special offer uh, 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 software and, and, and markup for it anymore. I just, I just make it a thing where I say, Hey, everybody that is uh, a, a Patreon backer by the last day of the month is going to get this. And it's usually an e-comic, maybe a collection. Uh, I've done like a collection of Halloween comics, a collection of Christmas comics, a collection of, uh, you know, D and D themed stuff. And then it's also like a, the latest chapter. If I've got the latest uh, chapter of evil Inc. done, I'll whip that into a uh, e-comic and that'll be the special giveaway. The thing about it is what you're trying to do is get people to stay another month, right? right. Cause if they stay until the last day of the month, then they're going to get charged and then they go on. So you want to keep people staying. And what I've been, and I've actually had some very good luck with this just by doing an unofficial special offer where I offer them something, a collection of something. And, and of course, the more you go, the more you create, the more of a body of work that you're going to be able to choose from. Mm -hmm. And then you collect that into a little e-comic, a little PDF, and poof, you send it out there and you're ready to go. I, 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 I always am very, very careful about my wording. Okay, in fact, I would even say, go over to my Patreon because I make these public posts. Uh, when I announce a new one, uh, look at the wording because the wording's very careful, uh, carefully done because you want to make sure that you're getting across that you have to be a member on the last day. And by the way, this is also going out to all of your existing patrons as well. So it's the people who are signing up new and the people who've been there all along, it's going to all of your Patreon backers on the last day. And then, of course, uh, um, in the first or the second of the month, you go through, you uh, go to Patron Manager, get all of your active patrons that are at the appropriate tiers and send them their link uh, to where you've got this as a downloadable, whether you're doing it on Dropbox. I use drive through comics all the, st all the time for stuff like that. Uh, give them their link, send it. I, again, you're going to want to send it to them in a direct message. You don't want to make this a post because technically you don't want people picking this up the next month or the month after that. This is just for those people that signed up or remained with you. You send that to them in a message and then they've got their download code and they can bring it in. So that's one way that I've done to, uh, and, I, and again, I've had a lot of luck with it to even out that monthly bump, because I'm telling you, I'm right there with you. <laughs> it drives me nuts when I see that number go down at the beginning of the month. Well, I'm going to I'm going to play point counterpoint here with Brad's idea, which is uh, I, while validating that that is a lovely idea. Yeah, I'm going to posit that that doesn't change a darn thing about how many people Brad was going to lose that month. And I'll tell you why. Go ahead. I'm not a mathematician, but on any given month. An average person holding a credit card has a one in 36 chance that that credit card is going to expire that month. Most credit cards yes. renew on a three year basis. Right. Um, and so you take 500, 1000 Patreon backers, just do the math of each one has a one in 36 chance of, of dropping out and then how quickly the average person can get to it. And you'll see mm -hmm. like some people right away, they're right back in it. As soon as they get the notification, they're right back in. Uh, but there's always stragglers for whom it takes three days, four days, five days. Sometimes it's a credit card problem. Wasn't necessarily an expiration. It might've been a cancellation due to, uh, you know, a false charge or something. And so they had to do a rigmarole. It takes them a couple of days to get things back on track. I think my own sense, my own spidey sense is if you're doing everything right all through the month, Nothing you do with the last week is going to make a difference because I honestly feel like mathematically, most of those people are just credit card expirations or credit card cancellations because of fraud. And they had to go through the rigmarole that that requires. And so there's a one in 36 chance, one in 48. If they're on a four year renewal, not a lot of people are. Uh, and so that's my take on it. And then, so I have a, a like, like, like Brad, I have the identical artistic response, which is, oh, no, no one likes me. People are running away. But then the logical side of my brain kicks in and I go, no, 
this is most likely just credit card <laughs> expiration <laughs> dates and they had yeah. to put it in a new card. It's going to take a couple days. Look again in a week and bada bing, bada boom. It's almost always fine five days in, seven days in. Um, yeah. And so b based on that track record, and I don't know how many years I've been on Patreon, five, six, seven, I don't know. Um, uh, if you look at the, the, the recovery a week later, that's what tells me that this is cards expiring, not people that no longer like my work, you know, right. mathematically. Yeah. So I think it's perfectly lovely that Brad has built up this expectation of this stuff coming in the final week. And, I, and who knows, it, that, it might be the, the nail in the coffin of keeping them around. I, I, I applaud Brad for it. I personally feel like mathematically, this is just a one in 36 chance of people's three-year credit card expiring. And it just happened to hit that month. And so 5, 10, 15, 20 people are dropping out that, that first week, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to redirect in two different ways just to make sure that I'm communicating clearly. Uh, number one, this is not something that just gets done in the last week of the month. No, I, in know, other I words, know, I know, yeah. This is something I launch on the at the first of the month and I'm promoting all the way through. And that's where I'm going to come around with number two. And that is, I think that although I, you and I might disagree with the, with the, with the breadth of what you're talking about, I think you, you're, you're right. We both agree you're right to an extent. A certain number of those are expired cards. What I, uh, I would like to suggest is that that work that I'm doing throughout the month is bringing enough new people in that they're offsetting those people yes. who are leaving Absolutely. because of the expirated yes. uh, cars. Yeah, and, and this is the point where I say, even though I've just said that anything Brad does in the final weeks or the days around that changeover don't have an impact, nobody puts out more content consistently across the month than Brad Geiger. I'm not in any way <laughs> uh, implying that. Like you, you yeah. consistently provide value for your patrons way more than I do, and I think I do a lot. But, but you have like there's something all the time going up on Brad's Patreon. So um, it is continuous. It is through the month. I'm just saying for for anyone who might have because sometimes Brad people hear us. And they hear the wrong thing. And I, yeah. for oh, anyone yeah. who thought like, well, I just do something around the end of the month and that keeps people on, you know, and it's like, no, that's, <laughs> that's not what does it. What does it is continuous value throughout the month and yeah. an awareness yep. that the majority of those people are just credit cards expiring or a credit card hiccup or a credit card problem, whatever you want to describe it as. And that, yeah. um, that most of whom self repair within five days. And we both yep. have seen that, you know, yep. uh, people get it right back up within, within four or five days of, of, uh, of the cancellation going on. And so now that being said, let's talk about the people for whom they've genuinely walked away, which is a different proposition, right? Right. Um, you have had them for a month. You've had them for a year. You've had them for multiple years. Uh, mm. There's nothing that can be done when their financial situation changes, right? Oh, yeah. I think both Brad and I would admit, and especially as maybe we're looking at a recession, especially mm -hmm. in those situations, there's not much that can be done. But for people for whom they, they say something like, this Patreon didn't supply what I expected or this patron, uh, the, the materials behind the veil of Patreon were not what I was hoping for, something along those lines. Brad, any uh -huh. particular advice for those kind of people and how we might handle that? I, for, for people for whom Patreon just isn't working out very well, for, is that what you're saying? For whom Dave Kellett's Patreon or Brad Geiger's Patreon. This is not what I expected, not what I wanted. Oh, no, there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, listen, you're going to do what you're going to do. They're either going to like it or they're not. And if they don't, that there's nothing there's nothing you can do about that. You know, and because if you try to, you you end up trying to please everybody and you end up putting out some really lackluster stuff if you do that. Oh, right? I see. So there's not a lot. There's not. And and by the way, I don't know if you ever look at your uh, uh, exit uh, interviews, but what I see almost all the way down the page is my financial situation changed over and over and over again, you know, yeah. the, the, and, and sometimes God, God love them. Sometimes they write these really nice notes, oh, apologizing yeah. for, uh, I've been laid off and this and that. Yeah. Like, don't, you don't have and to apologize like, to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was, I was happy. I had you for a month. I was happy because listen, I remember the days of advertising where let's face it. One reader would generate a nickel in terms yeah. of uh, advertising revenue or a dollar over the case of months and, and, and years. Uh, and the fact that you jumped in and as a $2 Patreon backer or a $5 Patreon backer, right. that's fantastic. No one ever expects you to stay longer than uh, it's good for you to stay. 
Uh, but you know, I, I, but, but yeah, there's, if you're doing what you're doing and, and, and they're leaving because it isn't a good fit for them. Well, there's, there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. I largely, I, in fact, I, I almost wholeheartedly agree with that. The only caveat I would say is Brad had an idea once and I have actually yet to do it, but I I would love to hear you talk about it where, um, you said every once in a while, like say a year or 18 months or 24 months, uh, you'll reach out in sort of a mass communication to everyone that's dropped off in the last year or two and say, hey, we've added something new to the Patreon and here's what it is. Do you find that that works for you when you've done? I've yet to do it, but have, do you find that that works for you? I try to do it very, very seldom because some people do react a little bit negatively to it. Yeah, right? like, I, I could see ah, myself being like, look, I, I did what I did and I'm out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll do that for a Kickstarter and oh. I'll do it uh, every once in a blue moon, I'll do it for one of these monthly special offers where I say, especially if it's a big one, I did one at the end of the year and it had like six different eBooks that collected a whole bunch of stuff. Right. And I'll send out to, to my followers on Patreon and, and we'll take a little sidebar there in a minute, but I, uh, to my Patreon followers, I'll say, listen, I, I, I promise I'm not going to reach out to you often, but this is such a big reward. I know that you've, uh, you know, enjoyed my stuff in the past. I wanted to let you know about it. If it's not a good fit, that that's fine. But here's what we're doing. Blah, blah, blah. You right. know, I just, and, and then every now and again, again, very seldom, but I can't tell you that it's never happened. They're like, I really didn't want to get this email. And I'm like, okay, I get it. It's yeah. not going to happen on a frequent basis. And I appreciate you letting me know. But what you do is I, I, I'm just going to take a real quick sidebar here. Followers on Patreon are yeah, people yeah, yeah. who probably never uh, they, they're, they're they're not currently pledging to you. And maybe they never did, but they just signed up to get public notifications of when you post. OK, and you can find them again, go to your Patreon patron manager and filter by the results. And you'll see followers as one of those uh, 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 categories that you're able to filter. And you can go in and send a message directly to people who have through Patreon actively chosen to continue to receive notifications from you. That's, that's what makes them a follower. Gotcha. They, you know, they, this is, this is not out of left field. This isn't anything that you have to worry about uh, it being uh, inappropriate. Uh, this they've chosen through Patreon to continue to remain some uh, uh, get getting some kind of notifications from you. They get classified as a follower at that point, and you can reach out to them again. This is this uh, this happens about as for me happens about as often as Dave honks his horn. Maybe <laughs> once, maybe twice, twice a year. This is not a Brad Geiger honk where you're doing it every day. This is this is very, very sporadic. <laughs> uh, uh, I, well, okay. So now I I say this with admiration. You have poked around the arcane sections of Patreon far more than I have, and and as a result, you have more knowledge than I do. Can I ask you about followers? Um, is is the idea here from Patreon's perspective, obviously this is for people that want to dip a toe in, but aren't yet ready to commit to Brad Geiger as a backer, right? So that's, I get the yeah. idea there, but is the idea from Patreon corporate that this is for the people that want to follow Brad on Patreon as though Patreon were a social media platform in a way, like this no, is all the public stuff Brad is sharing? My guess, and I, and I, 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 I'm Patreon, you know, would be better to, uh, could, could explain themselves better. But my, my feel for this is that these are people that either cannot actively pledge anymore, but they still want to keep in touch with what's going on yeah. so that maybe later on they see something and they're like, oh, I want to get back in. Right. I want to jump back in. Oh. Or these are people that are just curious. They're just like, nah, I wonder what this guy's up to. Right. And then they they sign up to become a follower and they're just getting notifications again until they're interested enough. Remember, you got to hear something seven times before you sign up on average, according to that old uh, uh, advertising uh, axiom. So it, it Patreon set that up so that they would have a little bit of a line of communication going. I don't know that it's people who are expecting a social media level of uh, communication, but they just want to kind of keep track of what's going on because they were interested or they're maybe kind of going to be interested. And Patreon wants you to have a way to 
reach those people. Gotcha. So these are folks that are Brad curious. They're yes. they're yeah. yes. They're, As are we all. <laughs> uh, then who among us is not Brad curious? Am I right? Uh, yes. Come on. Come on, folks. Um, OK, so they're Brad curious. And the idea here is that they'll get the sort of locked headlines. But via the headlines, they'll get a sense of how often Brad's posting, what kind of things he's posting. Yeah. What are they missing? Right. OK, I gotcha. So n- one final question on followers. Have you ever dug into how often or frequently or if ever a follower becomes a patron? Does that metric exist? Ah, that's a great question. I don't know that that metric exists. I I would love I'd love to see those numbers, but I I don't think that exists. Yeah, that's fair. I, and by the way, I, yeah. I don't know that I would dig into it. I, what would probably happen is I would see the number and I'd go, huh, you ever have that with your data? <laughs> yeah, you look yeah. at the number and you go, huh, well, <laughs> um, there's that. Yeah. I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know how to make that go up or make that go yeah, down, exactly. but there it is. Uh, one last thing I want to suggest just in terms of writing out that uh, that uh, churn and, and or just in terms of growing your Patreon in general. Right. Because that's that's really what we're talking about at the end of the day. If you're constantly growing, then that churn hurts a lot less. Right. It stings right. A, a lot less. Right. So let's go. I'm going to give you one more thing, Garth, that you can try out and this is something that that, again, you can you can try to offset those people who are leaving by new people who are coming in. Right. And that's something that I've been advocating time and time again. It's really, really hard to get people to understand what the heck's going on. Uh, I, I, I find I have to do so much explaining that it's almost counterproductive. But it's and, but we've talked about it here on the show. It's the Patreon content trade. Right. Yes. And what this is, is you find someone else who's giving exclusive and the exclusive is a key word there. Exclusive rewards that are maybe similar to you or in the same vein. They're they're kind of doing something similar. And you reach out to that person and say, hey, let's both build a little package, a little e-comic or a, a, a folder full of images or what have you. Right. And we'll have a day where we trade I'll present that to my backers at a certain tier. You present my stuff to your backers at a certain tier, and it achieves two things. Number one, I'm getting my stuff exposed to a whole new audience. Number two, I'm I'm giving my backers a, a, a surprise bonus reward that they weren't expecting. All of a sudden they open up, they say, Hey, here's this package by somebody who Brad uh, really respects or really likes as an artist or content that, uh, that he's excited about. And so everybody wins. Yeah. The reason that the part I've got to explain time and time again is that people are like, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to lose all my backers to you. Right. It, I, it, I, I don't, and this is one thing I have checked into every time I've checked the numbers, both patron, uh, numbers for both accounts go up. It's not like I a would whole bunch it. of people. I would believe it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like a whole bunch of people jump ship from one to the other. Although I'm sure that happens here or there, but what happens in, in, in the, uh, uh in the big picture is that the patron counts of both of those uh, artists go up because what happens is I like Brad. I like Brad. He just showed me Dave. Oh, great. Now I like Brad and Dave. Now I'm a Patreon backer of both Brad and Dave. Right. And, and you, you end up spreading some of those patrons around. It's, it's cross promotion, like in the good old days of early web comics, Mm -hmm. when we, when we lived and died by cross promotion, if it wasn't so gosh darn hard to explain to people, I'd be doing it more often. But literally, it, it's like it's like it's it's a laborious process to try to explain what the heck this is. Uh, well, no, I want to tell you that I have I have taken Brad's advice and done this in the past uh, with uh, John Rosenberg, with his um, scenes from a multiverse, which is a sci fi. Uh, it's more political, but it's a sci fi strip. I've done it with Baldwin uh, with uh, his sci fi strip. And and by the way, great results on both times. I think it was a rising tide for both titles. Uh, yes. Drive readers became scenes from a multiverse fans or for Baldwin's fans and, and vice versa. And um, in fact, I, I haven't yet mentioned it on publicly, but I will say it here because uh, Brad has an upcoming story on Drive and <laughs> he's written it. It's going to be fantastic. And Danielle Corsetto of Elephant Town and Girls with Slingshots oh. is drawing it and it's going to be fantastic. And I yeah. think what I will do in a version of what Brad's saying is I'm going to give your readers and your your Patreon folks 
uh, all three ebooks for free because why not? It's it's yeah. it's a forty five dollar ebook value, but why not give it to paying Patreon folks for whom they're going to see one of their favorite artists now doing this story let's let him yeah. dive in as easy as possible because i bet there's only going to be good results for all three of us when i do that yeah yeah it would be the perfect way to do that and and just again it's it's a win 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 for everybody yeah and especially for your patreon backers and again i always say you can't do it when you start to get a, a healthy uh, group on patreon you can't do you can't do too much Right. You, if, I, if I give every doggone thing that comes into my head, I'm thinking, could that be an exclusive reward and anything that comes up? Because it's like I want them to get lots and lots of posts from me. I want them to get ev- the last thing I want to hear is and, and and believe me, from coming from somebody that posts about 30 times a, a month. Every now and again, I, I get this response and it drives me up a tree. Uh, it, it, it's the one on the exit uh, survey that says. Brad Geiger did not interact as much as I thought he would, or he did not post as much as I thought he would. And I'm like, dude, I posted every day this month. <laughs> you can't say that. You can't. But uh, but even with all of that, you can't you can't put enough stuff out there. No, and if no. you get a chance to give your backers a little bonus, I say jump at it. Absolutely. And I say this as a backer of Brad on Patreon is that one of my favorite things that you did this past week is uh you you very often will film your process or or do this or that you know and Brad put up this uh, YouTube supercut of all the times that he's honked his horn in the last three years <laughs> yeah. and I gotta tell you I sat through most of the forty eight hours on YouTube of that supercut <laughs> and it was really enjoyable I gotta yeah. tell you it was so fun I had learned some new curse words that I did not know were in English and I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Dave, you know why I got this big smile on my face over here? It's because once again, we get to share with people that this show is being brought to them by DreamHost. We've been talking time and time again about owning and controlling your own work. A big part of that is having a website you can put your stuff on so that no matter what happens out there with yes. Twitter or Instagram or Webtoons or Tapas or Mastodon, well, that ain't going to be Mastodon, but <laughs> one way or the other, <laughs> you can have a place where you can always fall back to and control your stuff. That's a website. And DreamHost, I'm telling you, is going to make it so easy for you to do. I've been using and dream host for over 10 years and if you go to dreamhost.com slash comic lab you can see two special uh starter packs that they've got uh set up for you that if you're thinking about doing this for yourself you can start to dip your toe in the water and start moving along those directions yes. the first one is the shared starter plan that starts at two dollars and 59 cents a month the other one is the shared unlimited plan that's three dollars and 95 cents a month and as you go, as you grow, as you uh, get a better handle on what it's going to take for you to do that website, that package is going to grow and uh, evolve along with you. Absolutely. And uh, once again, dreamhost.com slash comic lab. And the, the biggest, uh, honestly, the biggest praise we could give it is that Brad has been successfully and happily with them for over a decade now. Yeah. And uh, the praise has not gone unnoticed by me. I got to tell you. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm telling you, you're going to be my own personal uh, project to get you over to dreamhost because I, I I'm going to listen. I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into numbers. 
because we were talking off the air. Oh. But we share. I, I shared what I was paying for DreamHost and what Dave is paying for his service right now. That I, if, if I remember right, was kind of pitched to you as a free service, but no, then well, it was not free. Like, no, no, not not free. But I just want to uh, say uh, the the company that I use. I'm not going to yeah. uh, uh, besmirch them by saying their name, but it rhymes with Schlamazon, <laughs> and is where I'm hosted. <laughs> And Brad and I, I, first of all, as I was talking about last week, uh, yeah. uh, it, it is so dang complicated behind the scenes yeah. on uh, on AWS. And I found out that I'm paying five to six times more a month than Brad is paying for yeah. a host that he is happier with, that he, it's yes. easier to use, the customer support is better and easier and more humane. And yeah. I I gotta tell you, Brad, I think I'm gonna make the jump. I gotta tell I'm, you. I'm telling you, I've, 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 I've gotta work on you because here's the thing. When I, I remember when you had that trouble with SSL, that oh certification. My God, yes. And it took you how long do you figure you took uh, how uh, how many man hours do you think that it that that took you? I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but I, I had an SSL certification problem on my site for no good reason. It just didn't yeah. auto renew. But trying to do it on the AWS thing, I probably wasted and I'm guesstimating here, but I probably wasted somewhere between 25 and 30 working hours over yeah. the course of a week, week and a half, trying to get this dang SSL thing working again until I eventually just hired somebody because I could not figure out how to get yeah. it working under AWS. And Brad goes, oh, that's one click on DreamHost. And I was like, ah, yeah. geez Louise, it's, <laughs> what am I doing here? And and not only that, but like, let's say you do get, uh, get into some kind of trouble. DreamHost, their customer support has been exemplary every darn time right that uh, once you get into uh, submitting a support ticket you get a you get an email back from an actual person and it's always been a dang delight to work with them so if you do get yourself into that situation you've got support crew right there and they've got your back so a huge shout out and a thank you to dreamhost and a reminder that the url you want to go to is dreamhost.com slash comic lab and they've got two specials up there waiting for you to go now, Dave, let's get back to answering some questions. We've got one here. This is kind of a delight, uh, as a matter of fact. This comes in from our Comic Lab backer, Pete, who says, I sent in a question almost two years ago asking whether or not to continue my 11 years running webcomic that had been put on indefinite hiatus. And your advice was to leave it be and start a new project instead. Following your advice, I jumped into a brand new project. Oh, thank God. Been, I was so yo. afraid it was going to be like, I've gone back to the project <laughs> hey, no, of 11 I years. Know. No, oh, we do have to take a pause and let this uh, let this nice person know that you've you've cleared the first hurdle. Yes, because yes. you did not go back to that first project. And 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 that is the that's the way it often goes. So kudos for you uh, for for doing that. But back to the uh, back to the question, he says, following your advice, I jumped into a brand new project and I've been plugging away at it in the time between then and now. I now have a backlog of about 23 pages as of this uh, moment, and I'm at a point where I can more or less manage one page a week. I have a website ready to go. Thanks, DreamHost. Oh, hey, look at that. <laughs> we didn't, yeah, we didn't pay him for that. He just threw it in. Uh, social media accounts at the ready, and my page is sliced and prepped for social media distribution. I finally set myself a launch date in the month of June, and I'm excited to finally make the leap. Other than just do it, do you have any advice for me as I inch closer to the launch date? I feel pretty well prepared having listened to you two every week since my initial question, but there's still that sense of what am I forgetting that's bothering me? Maybe all I need is a good verbal shove from the comics uncles. Thanks for all the advice and laughs over the years. My wife listens to the podcast as well, and she's not even a comic artist. She's a costume designer, but still gets lots out of your advice as well. So thank you very much, Pete. And again, kudos for getting this far and, and not going back. It yes. sounds like you're on the right track, but how can we position Pete in a way that he launches this thing at, without uh, having forgotten something crucial? Well, and before we dive into the answer, and, and boy, I've got a lot to say on this. I want to give a huge shout out to Pete's wife, who is awesome. Anytime yeah. someone in another art form listens to the podcast and yeah. uh, is deriving value out of it and joy out of it. Gosh, that's a cool feeling. So yes. thank you uh, for listening. And I'm so glad to see that a lot of our advice is at least in part applicable to costume design, which is fun. 
Um, yeah. Okay, so now back to the question. I also want to echo a congratulations on being able to step away from a project that your brain and your heart was telling you to stop with the first time when you mm-hmm. when you put it on hiatus at the 11 mark point, uh, the, the 11 uh, year point. That was the right move. And yep. I know it's still probably hard, but I think at this point with 23 in the bank on the new project, you're probably feeling like that might, might have been the right move. And I, I hope that it has been for you. So mm-hmm. now what to do. So you've got 23 in the bank and it sounds like you're going to be releasing them once a week. This is great. You're about a year, half a year ahead uh, and or will be by the time you launch in June, which is awesome. Yeah. So my suggestion now is See if there it might be a natural point. Uh, if you if you were to launch with three, launch with four, launch with five. I'm just picking the random numbers here. Yeah. Where it's a little more helpful for that first push if yes. there's a couple of them in the archives, right? Mm-hmm. This is not always the case, and it doesn't have to be the case because remember, it only applies for that first week anyway. Uh, six months from now, no one's going to remember how many you launched with. So right. it really is only for this first week. And you have to ask yourself, how many people can you realistically reach that first week anyway? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. But if you're feeling good about your buffer, and I think you should be at a half year point, then maybe launch with two, three, four, enough where people get the feel, get a little bit of an inkling of where the story is going to go. It's a little bit of a, 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 you know, Brad and I always say frequent, consistent, and significant. Mm -hmm. See if you can make the first launch significant within two or three pages in a way that maybe one wasn't. Any any first thoughts on that, Brad? I love that idea. I think that's perfectly fine. And again, if you can't do it, that's fine because what Dave said is exactly right. In six months, who cares? But uh, that first time, if you had a, a, a an opening where you can, even if you had to, uh, like, if, I don't know whether you were able to do it, but if you were able to set an emotional hook in that yes. first three or four pages, right, uh, that's a really good uh, opening. So I would, I would definitely suggest that. And the other thing that I would say, suggest is you said social media, that's very important and that's fantastic. Uh, I would also start thinking about an email newsletter. Right. That's another thing that oh, we yeah. found a lot of really good success with. And that's for a way for people to get your comic uh, uh, delivered to their email. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do an email newsletter. Uh, you can do that. You can also do some blogging in it and stuff like that. For me, I got to be honest with you. I think that comic is enough content that I just send my comic out and then I'll, I'll I'll sometimes put a little ad or a little promo at the top that says something about Patreon or if I'm doing a Kickstarter or something like that. But for me, I think that comic is plenty, right? If I'm going to write and ask me anything column, that's going to be going over to Patreon. That's Patreon content. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. But I, but, but however you decide works best for you, an email newsletter is another thing that I think that, this would be a perfectly good time for you to start building out. What else could we throw on his list to kind of give him, make him feel comfortable on this launch? Well, okay. So you had mentioned that you had gotten 23 comics done and you intimated that they're all ready to go on social media. But if, if they're not all 23 ready to go, I would highly advise taking this time to sort of pre-slice them so that they're all ready to go for both social yeah. media and for uh, a, a modifiable website. What's the, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm blanking on what that kind of uh, website. Uh, a, resp- a mobile responsive, responsive. Yes, a responsive yes. website. Thank you. So yeah. that if someone on mobile, someone on an iPad uh, has the comic ready to go, see if you can pre-slice all 23 of them. So get, get them as yeah. done as, as done can be and ready to go. They're in the hopper. And then I, I would suggest... If there's a week where you could do two instead of one, such that the next week you could do the following, which is to really do a deep dive and a lot of consistent work on all of your branding that will be going on that website and probably will be semi-permanent for the next year, two years, Mm -hmm. three years, four years. So have a hard look at the logo, have a look at your branding colors, have a look at all the fonts on the website are consistent. You're not overdoing it with too many different fonts for too many different things. Uh, Make sure that your copyright and all that is set up, all the little details of the website, but really focusing, I think, on branding for one week of this pre-launch period, I think is actually going to be beneficial to you. Because remember, you can then prepare the logos for MailChimp or your main newsletter. You can prepare it for uh, Twitter or, or Patreon or your Shopify site or whatever will eventually become your, your storefront. Uh, yeah. Getting all that done and ready to go is actually really beneficial in the long run. 
Yep. And I'm going to throw another thing into your list of things to do just to just to have this ready to go. Uh, and you can listen to a recent episode of Pro Tips. Uh, I don't know. It's either it's either recently uh, come out or it's going to come out very soon. It's it's going to come out right right around now. And that is this uh, one of a number of different ways for you to create an introduction to your comic, whether that's if whether you do that like a movie trailer or whether you do that with a, like a, a traditional web comics website about page or whether it's a, a, a small little e-comic or, or something that you do as a digital download. But I want you to have something in your back pocket that introduces people to the new comic. Here's here's the concept. Here's the central conflict. Here's the characters and interest introduces all of them in the same way that a movie trailer would do the same thing as a way of getting you interested, promoting it uh, and 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 getting uh, some kind of excitement built up around this thing. I'd like you to have at least one iteration of that, whether it's a video or a download or a, or, or a static thing that you can direct people to. I want you to have something ready to introduce the 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 big story that you're going to be going towards because I, I think you're going to be needing that as well especially in the opening months of publishing this yeah and i'm going to tell you one other thing that you can do pre-launch that is far easier to fix now than it is after you launch which is take a, a, a day a half day more than 10 minutes and really google the living heck out of your title uh, yeah. in different mediums, in different genres, mm -hmm. in different locations, because it is so much harder to find out six months in, six years in, that there is another comic out of Australia or New Zealand yeah. or the Czech Republic that has your exact yeah. title. And you just didn't stumble upon it. It didn't come across your radar. We can we can be operating even on the same internet in very different worlds sometimes regionally. Mm -hmm. And you don't wanna find out years from now that you're treading on the same exact title that someone else is, or even similar, you know? So try yeah. uh, plurals versus singulars in your title if it's, if it's uh, um, you know, the the app, if the name of the <laughs> if the title of the comic is something like the Apple cart tips, you're going to want to mm -hmm. search Apple cart as one word. Apple cart is two words. Yes. Apple cart plural. Apple cart singular uh, tips as tipping tips as tips tips as tip. Uh, you're going to want to yeah. do all the sort of Google tricks that you can do with Boolean searches uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that no version of your title exists in comics or graphic novels or in any comic adjacent industry that could trip you up six years from now uh, yep. and will really bum you out once you've built up an audience for it. <laughs> yes. So uh, I, these are all good things to do. And I, and, and I think that's a, I'm, 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 I'm kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel now. I don't know that there's a whole lot more that I would throw at you, but here's the thing. Uh, there's always going to be something. Yeah. There's always going to be something. And you're, that, that, that uh, two months from now, you're going to look back and you're going to wish you would have done. I wish I would have done this. I wish, I wish they would have said something about that. I wish that this other thing was on yeah. my radar at the time. Here's the thing. Again, go back to that thing. We always say about it being a marathon, not a sprint a at the end of the day. It really doesn't matter. We want you to be as well prepared as you can be, but if there's something that, that, uh, uh that, that fell through the cracks or just wasn't, uh, a uh, doable at this moment or wasn't even on your mind, it's okay. Yeah. This whole thing isn't about the launch. It isn't about what happens on day one. It's about that cumulative effect of doing it over and yes. over and over again. Yes. That slow growth, that organic growth, that that really is where the good stuff is business-wise. Uh, that's what I want you to focus on. I, 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 we gave you good stuff. Uh, we're, we're right there behind you because we know how it is, uh, how exciting it is and how nerve wracking it is to launch something new. And, and so we're going to give you some stuff to think about, but at the end of the day, uh, what I, 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 after that launch, I don't want your focus to be on that, uh, start line. I want your focus to be on the horizon. Cause that's where you're going to be heading for the next month, for the next, uh, season for the next year. And then some. Absolutely. And, and knowing, uh, I, we don't even need to know you personally, but just knowing yeah. you as an artist, fear yeah. can be the mind killer. So yeah. don't let the fear of starting keep you from clicking publish that first day is what right. Brad's saying. Like everything yeah. is fixable. Everything is repairable. And yes. you might say, well, what, maybe what if it gets into book form and then it's not repairable? I will tell you as someone who has published Drive for 10 years, 
that mm-hmm. I, when I went from my floppy drive books to my hardcovers, I changed the color scheme. I yeah. George Lucas some mistakes that I had made in the storyline and some of the yeah. art. Everything is fixable with time. Yes. And as Brad yes. said, it's all part of the marathon and the overarching goodwill that you will generate with your readers, not any individual mistake that you might make. So don't let fear be the mind killer. Jump in and best of luck to you. Absolutely. And, and, and honest to goodness, honest to goodness. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. This is uh, this is the best is case scenario. Dave and I are smiling from ear to ear right now because uh, you you did it. You did it. You you resisted the urge. You're starting something new that takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of uh, of of confidence and just uh, congratulations. We we couldn't be happier. Absolutely. So, Dave, let's take another one and see if we can keep this uh, happiness train a rolling over here. All righty. Here's the next question coming in from uh, patreon.com slash comic lab. And it says, hello, Brad and Dave. I am still relatively new to my journey and going through the podcast currently. Lots of pearls in here. I remember you guys agreeing that in lieu of learning drawing, one should learn writing. Well, and I'll, I'll, I'll pause that right there because we're going we're gonna to correct that in our answer, but it's not in lieu of learning drawing. No. It, it would, so I just want to put a little caveat I, I there. Just, I just about choked on my coffee. <laughs> um, so they, they continue. I believe this refers to longer comic stories. For standalone gag comics, on the other hand, it was recommended to learn to tell jokes and set up punchlines. This all makes sense, but I'm wondering about theme and character based comics. For example, Calvin and Hobbes is about boyhood and friendship. Sarah Scribbles is something along the lines of a quirky young woman. I want to create standalone gag comics with an overarching theme or character. So I'm wondering, what would you two recommend studying to learn to create something along these lines? Would you suggest I spend my time learning about how to specifically write characters? So, Brad, before we go into this longer answer, which I'm sure you're going to have a, a lot to chew on here, yeah. I want to ask you uh, to clarify, if you would. <laughs> I, this, this is the question again. I remember you guys agreeing that in lieu of learning drawing, one should learn writing. Would you mind clarifying that for us? Yeah, what we what we actually said was writing is more important than drawing. Right. And 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 it's always the writing that brings people to comics. Secondly, what I've said a lot of times is that the average web cartoonist, the average independent cartoonist came to comics because they're an artist and they're not focusing on the writing. Right. right. They came to it because it's a visual art form and they're not giving enough uh, attention to the writing. And so I've said in the past, you really need to uh, focus on learning how to write. I right. never said in lieu of drawing. You still right, got to know right. how to draw. You, it's not. It's not. I all I do is write. Uh, and 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 you know that there are some some outlier examples, and everybody's always going to point to XKCD, which is stick figures and everything, and 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 like that. However, I, I want to caution you as far as the advice that we've given on the show. We never said in lieu of. We said we said that writing should be a, a priority especially if you are already somebody that's good at art, you're not paying attention to the writing that we're, we're saying emphasize the writing. We're not saying to ignore the drawing. Yeah. If anything, we're saying 55, 45 or 60, 40 in terms of like the writing yeah. is just an ounce more, uh, has an ounce more importance than the, than the drawing, but we're not saying yeah. abandon. If you abandon the drawing, you get Fometi. And is that what you want? No one wants yeah. that. No Nobody one wants, wants Fometi. No, one, wants no one's that. asking or pushing anyone towards Fometi here. We, we, yeah. we're trying. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I agree with Brad on that one. And then as far as what you should be studying. So it sounds like you want to do uh, gag based humor based jokes, but you want to have a, a larger world, a, a continuing sort of uh, character arcs and character moments uh, mm-hmm. in the peanut style, in the Calvin and Hobbes style, in the sort of uh, for better, or for worse style of Lynn Johnston, where jokes are being told is what I'm reading, Brad. And you tell me if you're if you're getting something different. But. Over the course of months and years, we are coming to learn and know the larger world of the character. Is that how you learned or you heard this question? Oh, I heard it too. And it's, and it's interesting because I, I, what, what's the one thing in common of the three examples that you used? They were all comic strips. They, they were all, what kind of comic strips? Uh, um, North American newspaper comic, comic strips. strips. They were all newspaper comic strips. Oh, newspaper comic strips. Yes, 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 yes. And I, I want to caution you. First of all, is is that 
what you're talking about there was is very much a newspaper comic strip idea. This whole idea of 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 everybody knows that Linus sucks his thumb and so on and so forth. Right. I want to I want to we have to have a little bit of talk about this because by and large for a uh, a short form humor comic that is not the that that's these days more the exception than the rule. These days especially with social media the comics that are successful very much are more about the joke, not so much about. Yes, I know that 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 Beetle Bailey is always lazy, right? Right. So I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, but I want to caution you a little bit: is that it, 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 this is a newspaper comic concept that may that you may have a challenge translating to the internet. Yes, and I would actually like to continue that vein of thought because Brad is right. Uh, what you're describing was a very specific type of comics that were created for newspapers. And I yes. did this with Sheldon and Brad yep. did this with the early versions of Greystone Inn. They were created for a newspaper tradition where the audience consistently was checking in every day because they got their newspaper and with their morning coffee, they read the comics. Right. And yeah. we know that that's not the case online, that sometimes for reasons of algorithm or just because reasons of life, people will miss four or five Sheldons and then check yeah. back in again, right? Yes. Um, and so here's what happens. You do see people using a newspaper format, like the very, very talented Sarah Anderson with Sarah Scribbles, mm -hmm. which I love, I think is amazing. Yep. But let me ask you this, Brad, name the second character on Sarah Scribbles. <laughs> exactly. There is none. Because there they can't, none. you can't, you don't have, you don't have the daily check-in that you right. had with newspapers such that you could build a world out. And so what you end up getting is a very Ziggy like comic for a lot of online web comics, uh, myself included in, in a lot of respects. A lot of people know me as just the comic with the duck and, and that's right. what they remember, you know, because they don't they don't come to all the website enough or, or I don't come across their transom enough or, or because of the algorithm where they know the whole world that I've built. It's usually yeah. a joke delivery system is what I tend to be able to get to most days. Yeah. And I'm sure what Sarah does and other people. Um, and so what I'm getting at and what Brad's getting at is that the delivery system that newspapers enabled allowed for you to build over the course of decades. It took a long time until you cared about Schroeder in peanuts. That wasn't yeah. year one or year two or year five. That was year like <laughs> 10, 15, 20. That you started and, and daily check ins with Schultz, by the way. Right. And, yeah. And, and, and that's with a captive audience. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so what I'm getting at there is that um, is it possible? Yes. Yep. Is it possible yep. to build out his world as big as you remember with for better, or for worse or with peanuts mm -hmm. or even a smaller world like Calvin and Hobbes, which arguably had three or four main characters and then ancillary, maybe three or four additional lesser characters like Mo or the principal or this or that. Yeah. I would argue that even that is hard um, in today's internet comic reading habits uh, yeah. because it's just hard to get people to check in recurringly, consistently, day after day in order to build a world via humor yeah. delivery such that you see the bigger world. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's it's harder because the the delivery system has changed. So now let's talk about writing in general. Uh, you're saying, what should I learn how to, uh, what should I be focusing on when I'm learning how to write? And the answer is, it's it's all part of writing. In other words, you're saying, well, uh, I, I, I over here I've got long form and narrative, and over here I've got short form and punchlines, and over here I've got characters, and over here I've got themes. Which one should I be focusing on? And right. what I'm going to tell you is, it's all a part of learning how to write. And, right. and, and even like, certainly if you want to focus on short form humor, then yes, you're going to be really uh, drilling down deep on what it means to set up a punchline and deliver that punchline. But I'll also tell you that everything you learn about punchlines goes directly to writing really good adventure or really good romance because it's got the same theories of tension and release behind right. it. It's the right. same mechanics making it go. And you can't you can't just learn how to write characters because characters are a are a part of a much bigger picture. You can focus on a character, but but to say that oh, I I just want you to learn how to write characters, that's a nonsense statement. It doesn't mean anything. You don't just you don't just do this in a bubble. You you've got to learn how that character acts in the big picture of your writing. 
So what we suggest, and I think you and I probably are going to agree on this, Dave, if I can be so bold, is that you don't, it's like saying, I want to cook, but I only want to use celery. Well, that's not cooking. That's a part of cooking, but it's not cooking, right? right? So what we want you to do is anything that you do that that is in the uh, pursuit of learning to be a better writing, learning how writing works is going to make you a better writing. And of course, the more you want to focus after that in, in a broader sense, like I could see, again, if you want to concentrate on humor, yes, that's that's valid. But there are there's there are character dimensions to humor. There are theme dimensions to humor. Yeah. Right. It's you. You can't separate this st stuff out is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say. You should be looking at this more as a big picture as as writing uh, than you are just looking to get to a granular level on this stuff. Yeah. And one of the reasons why like a liberal arts education always starts off with broad generalizations of and, and introductions to broad spectrums of, of whatever the topic is, is because uh, to, to go back to Brad's helpful visual of uh, learning to be a chef, OK, let's say you want to be a pastry chef and you're like, I don't I don't care about I don't need to know about proteins. I don't need to know how to cook meat or chicken or fish. I don't I just want to do pastry. Right. Yes. But by knowing how salt and fat and acid and heat and yeah. sweeteners <laughs> and umami and how all of that works, mm -hmm. you will be a better pastry chef. And so you have to start with the broad stuff first yeah. and then start to fo focus and, and, and you know, laser in on on certain things. So. Um, I would advise, based on what you've described, um, that broad reading across comics, everybody from from uh, Watterson to Chris Claremont to Lynn Johnston to Kathy Geiswhite to to Blankets to, you know, last summer, my, uh, I'm trying to remember the title, but the last summer book that had popped into my head. Anyway, what I'm getting at is reading broadly across comics and enjoying pop culture and literature broadly as well, yeah, but I reading gonna, deeply. Yep. Hopefully yep. you've been doing this consistently and, and thoroughly in your adult life is that you're taking in a lot, you're reading a lot. Um, and because what that will do for you is that it will start to see where patterns exist in storytelling and where people mm -hmm. successfully break patterns and how that works for you. And again, like Brad said, how tension is built up in both drama and in comedy and how yeah. tension is popped and how those characters navigate their arc with that tension building up and with eventually being popped. And then as you get into it, um, find the things that you really resonate, find the writers that you personally think did it right. And then yeah. start to break down, physically break down, write down a sheet of like, how did they do this? What, what yep. steps did they take? How did they navigate this character arc or this reduction of tension in, or, or how they popped the tension? All that kind of stuff as you break it down in detail can be very helpful, um, as yes. you go into it. Yeah. So it's not just reading comics. It's about reading in general, reading yeah. books, reading everything you can get your hands on and reading stuff that really lights your fire. <laughs> and also, also read some really terrible stuff, <laughs> read some <laughs> yeah. horrible stuff. And I really mean that uh, sincerely, because when you uh, read something that just hasn't been done very well, and there's a lot of it out there, <laughs> there's a lot of it out there. Uh, when you read something that hasn't been done well, it, 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 it's, it, it, it hits your brain and you're like, oh, why did they do that? And then you can deconstruct that and say, oh, I'm never going to make that mistake because that really stinks. Yeah. Reading terrible stuff is as important as reading good stuff. It's like touching a hot stove. You literally learn like, oh, I don't want to do that. That thing. I, yes. I don't know what that yes. was, but I don't want to do that. I, I want to yeah. I want to construct my characters different. I want to construct my storylines differently. So, yes, reading bad stuff, not all the time, but like read a couple of good things. Bang, bang, bang. Really classics yep. of comics that are of literature and then jump in on some weird ash can that you got at an independent press conference and, yeah. and all, uh, uh, you know, comics conference. And oh boy, you'll see where it falls apart. You'll be like, oh, the pacing was wrong. The character yep. development was wrong. The settings were, were poorly constructed. And, and you'll, you'll see it because you're starting to distinguish quality from poor writing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's our uh, advice to you is that, that, that when we're talking about learning writing, we're talking about uh, a, a, in a broad sense, right? If you can take a class that you can uh, focus on writing, uh, I'm not that worried about you know, what kind of class it is, although the closer it can be to 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 what you're uh, it, creatively interested in is great. But anything that you do to learn writing is right. going to help you but again, because chances are, if you're like most of us. And by the way, this includes me. This includes Dave. 
right? We all, many, many of us, I'd say 80% of us, if I had to guess, uh, came to comics because we were artists first. And the writing, had, we, we came along kicking and screaming, right? right. Uh, so anything that you do at this stage of the game that teaches you good writing is time well spent. And honestly, um, uh, screenplays and drama yes. are wonderful for showing you how you can paint purely with words. No mm -hmm. scene descriptions, no nothing, where yeah. it's literally just what the characters are saying that's painting the scene for you. And eventually a dramaturg or, or a director, will, will uh, a set designer, will bring that to life in a way that will reinforce what the play is trying to show you. Right. But if a playwright can do it just with words, that is great for learning. So mm -hmm. I would say if you can take a drama class, if you can, in terms of writing, if you can take a screenplay class, what I'm getting at there is a lot of community colleges or local high schools or, or colleges or, or regional classes won't offer comic specific writing. And in a lot of respects, uh, drama and screenplays are about as close as I think as you can get to a dialogue based system where words really matter in order yeah. to get across what's happening in the scene. Absolutely. And, and listen, Dave's right. Words matter. Words matter. Incredibly, incredibly important. And if, for example, let me give you some words that matter right now. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and lives in. <laughs> I was so happy with that transition. I started stuttering. Oh, my God. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. I'm so glad that Brad has started to incorporate the mid-show whiskey shots that he started to do. <laughs> Your host, my friend, Brad Gagger. He's the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evilcomic.com. And my friend... And Dave Kelly, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. It was made all the funnier by the fact the contrast against, I'm going to tell you, words matter. Words are important. Words are serious. The Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at TheWorldRecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star review on Spotify, where we are burning up the podcast charts. Yes, and Comic Lab is made possible by your support on Patreon.com, so we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash Comic Lab, and one more time, as Brad Geiger drives the merry streets of Philadelphia. <laughs> Get out of the way, you son of a bitch! <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have to tell you this about my new horn. I have evolved. I've, it's gotten a little bit better every time. The, my biggest problem with the Mazda horn was that it was very polite. It's a... And I, and I, I don't know whether it's a cultural thing, but when I would get angry behind the wheel of my Mazda, when I first bought it, it was a peep. It was peep, peep, <laughs> peep, peep. <laughs> and I would be like, Can't you move your fucking truck. Peep, peep. <laughs> it was much too polite. So then when I burned that one out and I got my second one, it sounded like the road runner, which was a little bit more aggressive, but still very friendly. It was more of a me, me. And I'd be like, hey, hey, get off your phone. Meep, meep. And I, that's still this one. It's got two notes in it. And it's and it's a much more throaty, full honk, honk. I finally gotten up from 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 beep, beep to meep, meep to honk, honk. And I got to tell you, if this one burns out, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I, I so I want to I want to put this out there to the audience. If anyone knows of any manufacturing that's done by, say, uh, 12th century Vikings or perhaps by the Visigoths, something, a horn that implies that Brad is going to conquer your lands and burn down your villages. That's what we're looking for in a car horn. Brad is not not satisfied with it. By the way, I just got to tell people that mid show when we were uh, switching audio tracks, I go to Brad. Brad, doesn't it tell you anything that you have now burned out two horns in this car, two horns. And Brad tried to sell me on this bullshit. He goes, well, David, David, you have to understand the second horn was a used horn. It wasn't, it was. it, it wasn't at its full potential. And 
and this son of a bitch tried to tell me that it was not his fault of him laying on the horn. It was, that it, it was, was, it was a used horn. I'm telling you, got up there in my defense. In my defense, it was it was. A, you, you got it from a salvage. He put that in. I don't know that it was a brand. It did not. It had a lot of miles on that horn. And I'm not. I'm just saying it had its time. And now. I'm, <laughs> You're torquing me on purpose. 